This is the lecture on the tragedy of the commons. The objectives of this session are I'm going to describe the tragedy of the commons and we're going to explain about an invasive species and how invasive species can be considered tragedy of the commons. So what is tragedy of the commons? Well, William Foster Lloyd, a professor of political economy, published a series of papers in the 1800s. Um, in his two lectures on the checks of population, he introduced the concept of a commons. And a commons is a shared space. And just like ecosystems can be as large as the earth, so can a commons all the way down to maybe even a neighborhood garden can be considered a commons. So any shared space. It could be the world's air, it could be um, all the land in the world, it could be the land in Arizona, it could be the land in New Jersey, it could be the land in Pennsylvania, it could be water, it could be the Delaware River, it could be um, it could be the Atlantic Ocean, so it could be the air over a certain state, or it could be the air of the entire world. So all of these are considered commons. They are shared by everyone. So William Foster Lloyd lived in the 1800s, and when he gave these lectures, um, he, of course, used an analogy that related to the people of the time. If we were to re-kind of lecture on William Foster Lloyd's idea of the commons, we would, of course, talk about something a little bit different. So today we could talk about the Gulf oil spill as a tragedy of the commons, whereas in the 1800s, William Foster Lloyd used a pasture scenario because that is what related to the people of the time. The main issue that William Foster Lloyd wanted to talk about in his lectures was this idea of the commons and at the time the biggest issue was population explosion. Now today the commons can be across any issue dealing with the environment. It can be pollution of air, it can be use of land, it could be the pollution of our, of our oceans. All of these are common issues. But remember at the time the biggest issue was population. So when you read Garrett Hardin's rebuttal to William Foster Lloyd you'll see the main theme is population. It doesn't mean that the commons problem only relates to population. It's just that that, that was the example that they were given at the time. The main goal of this commons problem was to talk about our short-term gain. As humans, we have this inherent need for greed. It is something that we are born with. And this inherent need for greed causes us to look at these shared commons with a short-term goal rather than the long-term interests of that commons. So we tend to look at it as, well, I need water for now, so I should be able to use as much water as I possibly want. Instead of thinking about that, if we use all the water here, then someone else may not have access to water. So this is a big issue. For example, the Gulf oil spill, one of the main things was, was we wanted, we leased out the oceans to private companies and those private companies look for profit. So they wanted to take the oil out, but they didn't, and that's for the short term gain, which is profit, right? But they didn't think that when they didn't put in the correct valves, shut off valves, that they were going to ruin the ecosystem for a lot of people for the long-term interests of society. So here is what William Foster Lloyd used as his example, the pasture scenario. So it would be as if me, my neighbor, and my neighbor across the street were, were sheep herders. I have a sheep, they have sheep, we all have about the same amount of sheep. I go down town to Fabric Row, I shave my sheep, I take the wool, and I say, listen, how much are you going to give me for my wool? And somebody on Fabric Row says, listen, I'll give you 50 bucks for your sheep's wool. I come back and I happen to mention that to my neighbor, and my neighbor says, oh my gosh, wait a minute, you got 50 bucks for your sheep? Oh, okay. And then all of a sudden the next day he shows up with four more sheep. And then I say, well, he's going to make more money than I'm going to make, so then I add sheep. But we're, we didn't think about the entire pasture as a whole, which is the fact that each one of these sheep needs to eat grass. They need to graze, and they need to have space to graze. And we forget about that. So what we do is we're looking for that sh short-term gain and that inherent need for greed, which is money, and we forget to think that our sheep need a place to graze. And what we do is that my neighbor across the street finds out he had sheep and then we overrun this area and overgraze it and then there's no grass left. All our sheep die and guess what? We lose all of our money because we were looking for the short-term gain instead of the long-term interest.
Now, William Foster Lloyd says that the best way to solve this commons problem of the population issue is to privatize. He says, well, listen, if you all own your own little plot of land, you'll most likely take care of it. And he says, so if you own it, you take care of it. And guess what? Everyone can add as many sheep as they want to their own little private land because then they're, it's their problem. It's their, you know, they're going to look for their long-term interests. And in the 1800s, it was passing that farm on or that grazing pasture on to future generations. So more likely you're going to take care of it because your sons are going to take it over and they're going to take care of it. So that was the idea. Now along comes Garrett Hardin. So this is, this this kind of gives you the little details of the pasture scenario of these slides. In 1960, Garrett Hardin wrote a rebuttal. Now, isn't that crazy? He wrote this paper in the 1800s, and Garrett Hardin comes along in the 1960s. And let me tell you, someone else, there's always people writing articles on Tragedy of the Commons till this day. So this conversation continues, has been continuing, because we haven't been able to solve the Commons problem yet. So who knows, maybe one of you guys in your graduate research will write a paper on the tragedy of the commons. That way, I would love to read it. Um, so in 1960s, Garrett Hardin wrote a rebuttal to William Foster Lloyd's lectures. Now remember, William Garrett Hardin's rebuttal had to do with population, even though the population problem could be re-substituted for any environmental problem. So if you're reading that paper and you say, well, this paper is only about population, that's not true. It could be about any population's problem. And he says that he termed the misuse of the commons the tragedy of the commons. So Garrett Hardin's the one who coined the phrase tragedy of the commons. And in his in his essay, he says that we've implemented all of these technical solutions. And in his article, he talks about all these different technical solutions. He talks about privatization of national parks. He talks about cap and trade. He talks about mutual corrosion. He talks about the welfare state. He says we put all of these tools into place, but they're not working. And he gives examples of all of these technical solutions that, of course, have maybe helped a little bit in solving the commons problem, but they haven't stopped technically the overuse of the commons. And he says, because they need an extension in morality. So each one of the technical solution when we create it needs some sort of moral component to it. If not, then we cannot solve the commons problems because in order to solve the commons problems, people need to understand what they're doing and how they're short-term interest you know their short-term gains that they're looking for hurt the long-term interest at, of the whole world so for example i only want to drink bottled water well if i only want to drink bottled water i have to remember that okay that's my short-term gain which is the fact that i want to drink bottled water but i'm not looking at the long-term interest of society which is where do all these plastic bottles go oh they're burned in third world countries because they have less environmental standards and guess what most of the time the people who work in those plants are women and children and guess what the women and children in you know breathe in all those toxins and they die and they have abnormalities oh that's okay because they're in third world countries so i'm better than them so it doesn't matter to me so we you know we need a moral component, which is the fact that, okay, another person is dying so I can drink bottled water. <laughs> I mean, so we need to think as a whole and we need to have these moral components involved in these technical solutions. So let's talk about the technical solution of privatization. So privatization, yeah, works on the surface, is that technically if you own it, you take care of it more. That's not always the case, right? There are slum lords, right? And those slum lords, they just want to make a profit. A lot of times privatization involves making a profit. When someone has a profit involved, most likely they are still looking for their short-term gain rather than the long-term interests of society. And that Gulf oil spill is an example of that. One of the other problems with privatization is the fact that there's a social justice issue involved, is that if we privatize commons and we charge money for people to enter, then guess what? It is now a social justice issue because only those that can afford to go in are going to be able to go in. And the reason for the commons is they're a shared space. Issues with a welfare state. So believe me, I have no problems with a welfare state. I believe that people should have a chance to get their feet back under them if something bad happens to them. But what William Foster, what uh, Garrett Hardin talks about is the fact in terms of population is that 
you would stop having children if you knew you didn't have the resources to take care of them. But instead, a welfare state gives you that sense that you can still have children and not run out of resources. And he thinks that's because there's no moral component. There's no educational or moral um, talk about in the welfare state. The other thing is mutual corrosion. So we tax people or we find people and he talks about parking spots or he talks about taxation or he talks about cap and trade. Um, and he says it works for a while, but there's always going to be people who want to beat the system, who don't want to pay their taxes or who want to cheat the parking meters. And this still hurts the commons as a whole. And that's because there's no moral component involved, which is telling people, well, listen, if you do this, then this is what the consequence is going to be. And so these are problems with the welfare, with the uh, mutual corrosion, the welfare state, privatization. And he talks about all these technical solutions in his article. Now, while I know it's 32 pages, now that you have some basis on it, I think it'll make the read easier. One of the biggest problems with commons is that when we try and regulate commons, we run into the issue that a lot of commons are based upon the fact of our freedoms. So if we tell people not to have children, which is what the One China policy did, and it was retracted in, in the fall of 2015 because there's tons of social consequences we didn't think about, is that when we tell people they can only have a certain amount of children, is that we are infringing upon their personal freedoms. When we tell people they can only drink a certain amount of water a day, then we're infringing upon their personal freedoms. And so when we do these things, or you can only breathe in so many pints of air a day, then you're infringing upon people's personal freedoms. And these are one of the biggest hurdles we have to overcome with commons is that the commons are a shared resource and that we might have to infringe upon people's personal freedoms if we want to save the commons which is our shared resources as a human population okay so quickly I want to move on I'm running out a little bit of time here is me um, talking about all the different examples etc um, but I want to briefly talk about how invasive species can be considered tragedy of the commons Invasive species are a species that it is brought in for a short-term gain, usually by a human population. So, for example, we introduce a species into an area to solve a problem. When we do that, a lot of times those species take over that population. And it's because we were looking for a short-term gain, which is, oh, look at this beautiful flower I saw in Hawaii, and I'm going to bring it in in my suitcase. But what we don't think about is the consequences of bringing that flower in and planting it in my garden. For example, bamboo, great, great example of this. People have brought bamboo in, they plant it in their yard, and then five houses down, bamboo pops up in their yard because it, it actually travels under the ground its root system and it can pop up in other places bamboo is very invasive especially in Philadelphia and the reason for it is people brought it in because it it's a wonderful way to make privacy in your yard it grows really fast and it's cheap and so people put it in their yards in Philadelphia but they they didn't realize that it was invasive and that it was you know going to spread and ruin the whole neighborhood so people were looking for their short-term interests rather than long-term gains now you don't want to get confused though nature can nature so a bird could take a take a seed and fly somewhere and put it into another part of nature right and then that species could overgrow that area right or uh, they could carry a fish and put it somewhere else okay they're examples of invasive species being implanted but in a natural way so when I talk about that case I'm not talking about that that could be considered a tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons with invasive species is only when the short-term gain is for human use and they bring in a species. The Asian carp is an example of this and you'll have wonderful videos about that this session. The, the toothy pike is another example in California where we bring something in to solve one problem and then the, the situation you know, spirals out of control. Okay, so this is how an invasive species can be considered a tragedy of the commons. Remember, if it's naturally occurring, it is not considered a tragedy of the commons invasive species. So this is the end of my lecture. I hope you enjoyed reading Garrett, um, Garrett Hardin's article as well as all the videos under this session.